Good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar session on the topic of HPV infection risk in ultrasound. Uh, my name is John Burdak and I lead the clinical affairs group at Nanasonics and I'll be monitor, uh, moderating uh, tonight's session. So <clears throat> we are delighted to work again with, with ASM uh, to bring you information about the latest research in infection control in ultrasound. Um, and we're very fortunate to uh, have with us one of the world's leading HPV researchers, uh, distinguished Professor Craig Myers. Before I introduce Professor Myers and talk about his work in more detail, I just wanted to go through a few housekeeping issues. Uh, so on the topic of uh, CPD, tonight's webinar is accredited by the Oscillators and Society for Ultrasound and Medicine, uh, and one CPD point will be awarded for participation in the uh, full webinar session, uh, and ASM will issue each attendee a certificate following, uh, following the attendance. Uh, the webinar will also be available for on-demand viewing uh, and CPD credits will be allocated after watching uh, via the registration process. So if you want to forward the link on to any colleagues or, or friends, feel free to do so. Uh, we will send a, a link out to all the registrants uh, for the on-demand webinar in the next few days. So as, as a CPD event, the webinar uh, obviously includes some learning objectives. So at the end of the session, you should be able to understand the risks and dangers of HPV infection, describe the evidence for the risk of HPV transmission from ultrasound probes, and understand the efficacy of hospital disinfectants against HPV, and finally, describe the regulatory criteria to claim efficacy against HPV. Um, if you have questions as we, as we proceed through the presentation, please uh, enter them into the, the contact box that you should see on the left-hand side of your screen. They will come through to us and we'll be able to pass them on to Craig at the end. Um, and hopefully we should have around 15 minutes or so to, uh, to speak with Craig at the end and, and ask those, those questions. So um, it's, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce you to Professor Craig Myers uh, this evening. Craig is a Distinguished Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at Penn State University College of Medicine. Professor Myers has achieved national and international renown for his work on human papillomaviruses. He has published over 100 studies covering a wide range of areas including HPV replication and oncogenesis, viral structure, infectivity pathways, immune protection, and uh, describing the role of HIV and anti-HIV drugs on HPV-associated cancer. So more recently though, Professor Myers um, has published a number of papers on the resistance of human papillomavirus to disinfectants. And this has had a significant impact on how we approach the classification of disinfectants, uh, in particular high-level disinfectants. So HPV is particularly relevant to ultrasound um, as it is the causative agent of cervical cancer and a leading cause of oropharyngeal and anogenital cancers. And of course, these are the body sites that are typically involved in intracavity ultrasound procedures. So I'm sure you will agree that it's very important to understand how to reduce HPV transmission uh, for these procedures. So I'll now hand over to uh, Professor Craig Myers uh, to give us an update on HPV disinfection and how to reduce transmission risk in ultrasound procedures. Thank you, John. Um, welcome to everybody who's uh, participating in this webinar tonight. We're going to be talking about breaking ground in HPV disinfection, reducing HPV transmission risk from ultrasound procedures. Before I begin, I want to just uh, state my conflict of interest that part of the studies presented today were funded by Nanosonics Limited, and I'm presently a consultant for Nanosonics Limited. And the disclaimer is that the views expressed in these presentations are those of the author or authors and do not necessarily reflect the position or policy of the Australasian Society for Ultrasound Medicine. So why are we talking about HPV tonight? Well, I've been working on HPV for over 30 years now. We've learned a lot and understand a lot about how HPV can cause cancer. But we haven't, uh, up to recently, been able to produce large amounts of HPV in the lab. We in our lab have developed a technique to grow natural infectious HPV. We tested the virus recently against many common disinfectants, 
and we were surprised to find that the results showed many disinfectants are not effective at deactivating or killing HPV. Today, you'll be given a rundown on what you should do to mitigate HPV transmission risk from ultrasound probes. So we all know that HPV is a clinically important virus, probably represents over 5% of all cancers in the world. HPV can cause cancer in both sexes. Uh, nearly 100% of all cervical cancer cases are due to HPV, but HPV can also cause anal cancer, up to 88% of the cases. 50% of penile cancer cases are due to HPV. 70% of vaginal cancer cases and 43% of vulvar cancer cases, and anywhere between 13 and 56% of oral pharyngeal cancer cases are due to infection by HPV. So what is important for tonight is that these probes contact common HPV cancer sites or common sites that are infected with HPV. So intracavity ultrasound is associated with the highest cancer risk regions. So over here on the left, you can see the transvaginal probe, which comes in contact with the cervical cancer sites. And then you have the transesophageal probe, which of course comes in contact with the esophageal cancer sites, and the transrectal probe, which will contact the anal cancer sites. So a little bit on the difference between high risk and low risk HPV. 25% of people are infected with HPV, but only less than 5% of those people are infected with a high-risk type. And high-risk means that these types are well associated with causing cancer. So high-risk HPV 16 and 18 can cause up to 70% of cervical cancer in the world. And people with an HPV 16 infection are 700 times more likely to develop cervical cancer than those without. But we often think and we teach of HPV being a sexually transmitted disease, which it is. In the United States, it's the most common sexually transmitted disease we have. HPV transmission, though, through sexual activity is, is very well established. But Recently, there's been a growing recognition or a growing understanding that HPV can also be transmitted non-sexually. There's the potential for self-inoculation. There's the potential for inanimate object inoculation and inoculation in the environment. And listed here are a few publications that discuss the potential for non-sexual transmission, for non-sexual HPV transmission uh, in the literature here. So we know from uh, the, again from literature that there's a potential for HPV transmission from probes. Children have contracted HPV without sexual activity. We know that at any one time, 20% of people with anal genital infections have the virus on their fingertips. There's poor compliance with cleaning and disinfection. And HPV is found on probes after proper reprocessing of those probes. We know that HPV can remain infectious in a typical dry room environment for many days, and HPV is highly resistant to disinfectants. Now, most of us think that, you know, these probes are covered with a sheath or a condom and that this will protect against HPV transmission, but I'm here today to tell you that this does not reliably uh, mitigate HPV transmission risk. These probe covers and condoms can break and the breaks can be microscopic, meaning that if you take the time to examine the cover to look for breaks, you may not be seeing them. There are several uh, publications on this. In 1995, there was a publication showing that the probe sheaths can break 25 to 81 percent of the time. In 1997, 98, in the year 2000, condoms were studied as, as transvaginal probe cover sheath and they were found to break about 10 to 15 or 10 to 5 percent of the time and in 2007 <clears throat> condoms used with transrectal probes were found to break over almost 10 percent of the time uh, the FDA mandates that high level disinfection regardless of probe cover use needs to be used 
So HPV transmission from ultrasound probes is something we all need to worry about. This is a paper that was, um, it, it comes from um, Austria. Um, it studied the presence or the contamination of HPV in a gynecological office. And so what they did here is they went into some hospital offices and some private practice offices, and they just sampled different, uh, different surfaces in these offices, that um, some would, of which would have the potential to come in contact with mucosal surfaces uh, of the patient, creating a high potential, uh, potential for transmission risk. So you can see here over in the pictures that the colposcope and these, again, is after the proper, proper disinfection protocols were, were done, that the colposcopes had, still had HPV on them over 43% of the time. Even the, the lamps used in the room had the HPV contamination at 37%. The glove box was nearly 10% of the time contaminated with HPV. And the ultrasound uh, gel tubes had about 6% of the time contamination of HPV. So there is a potential risk for transmission in these rooms. Proper storage of ultrasound probes is important. They should be stored where there is no airflow um, in clean location and probe storage covers. This will prevent recontamination of the probe from the environment. Now, most uh, areas of the world adopted the system based on the Spalding criteria, which was uh, written in the 19, late 1950s. Um, disinfection of medical devices or surface depend on its intended use. So you can look here in our little uh, table, the intended use or the contact site classification and the level of disinfection required. So the contact site, if it's going to be sterile tissue or blood, it needs to, it is a critical site and it requires sterilization of the equipment used. Mucos, mucous membranes or non-intact skin are classified as semi-critical and they require high level disinfection. And then healthy intact skin, if it's what's going to be contacted, then this is a non-critical classification and it requires low level disinfection. So choosing the right disinfection method for your ultrasound probes requires that you decide what is the probe going to be used for. Um, if the probe contacts sterile tissue or blood, such as in surgery and operative procedures, drainages, and so forth in this box, um, then it is considered cl critical and requires sterilization or high-level disinfection and the use of a sterile sheath. These are the present protocols that are that um, define what is required. Uh, if the probe contacts mucous membranes or non-intact skin, such as in transvaginal scans, transrectal and transesophageal scans, or other uh, things listed in this box, then it, re it is a classification of semi-critical, um, and it requires high-level disinfection with the use of a sheath. If the probe only contacts healthy or intact skin, such as in a transabdominal scan or a surface ultrasound, this is classified as non-critical and requires only low-level disinfection. So looking again here, each disinfection level is defined by a specific pathogen activity spectrum. So in the case of the critical classification, which requires sterilization, the definition for this is that it will destroy all forms of microbial life. Therefore, should it kill HPV? Yes. According to the definition, this should kill HPV. If you look at the classification for semi-critical, and this is a key area of our uh, discussion today, this is classified as high-level disinfection. And the definition for this is that it destroys all microorganisms except spores under normal use and that it will kill spores at extended contact times. So according to this definition, it should be able 
to kill HPV. So if you're using high-level disinfection, according to the definition, HPV should be deactivated or killed after process, processing under this classification. So common liquid chemical disinfection, disinfectants have not been tested against HPV until now. We decided a couple years ago to test the HPV efficacy of some common liquid sterilants, uh, high-level disinfectants, and low-level disinfectants. <coughs> um, so this was, <coughs> we were able to do this, excuse me, Um, we were able to do this because we've developed a way to grow HPV in culture. We do a culture system called the organic typic culture system, which mimics the growth of epithelium in culture. So we grow the epithelium in culture for 20 days. We can harvest that tissue. If that tissue is infected with HPV, then during the growth, HPV will replicate itself. So when we harvest the tissue and grind down the tissue in a downs homogenizer, we can collect the supernatant, and in that supernatant, we have native infectious HPV. <clears throat> this is the virus that's equivalent to the HPV virus that is infecting humans. So, prior to 2014, no disinfectant had ever been tested against native HPV. So these studies, we decided to use the suspension test for our first go around. We used infectious HPV-16. We mixed it with the liquid disinfectants in the suspension test. We waited for five, 45 minutes at room temperature, and this exceeds most of the manufacturer's recommended contact times for the disinfectants used. We then neutralized the disinfectant. We collected the remaining virus and tested it for infectivity to see how much of the virus was actually deactivated or killed by the disinfectant. So here is a table of the different disinfectants you, we use. You can see on the left the different disinfectants, glutaraldehyde, OPA, ethanol, isopropanol, phenols, parasitic acid, or hyperchloride or bleach. Uh, we list here their use, whether they're typically used for semi-critical medical devices or non-critical uh, environmental surfaces or hand rubs. We, uh, according to definition, are these suitable for probes? And the top two, the glutaraldehyde and the OPA, are uh, defined as suitable for probes. They both, the GTA and OPA, are in the disinfecting class of high-level disinfectants. And according to definition, as we just went over, they should be able to kill HPV. So here is the results from that first study. This is a graph. The y-axis is a log 10 reduction of native HPV. So we would take our HPV and measure infectivity and look for the log reduction in infectious particles. You can see on the bottom the, the uh, the x-axis, the different uh, disinfectants we use, the ethanols, isopropanol, GTA, OPA, phenols, parasitic acid, and hyperchlorite. And you can see on the graph our dotted red line, which represents a four-log reduction in um, infectivity, which is required by both the TGA and the FDA. And this is mandated minimum efficacy for high-level disinfectants. Um, you can notice here right away that the GTAs at both con uh, concentrations and the OPA, neither one of these was able to induce or create any deactivation or killing of HPV particles at all. The only things that were able to deactivate HPV in this study were the high concentration parasitic acid and hyperchlorite. And I must uh, point out here that this high concentration parasitic acid is not approved by the FDA, so it's, it's not available for use in the hospital setting. And hyperchlorite is not approved for use on these devices. So the only things that worked at deacting the HPV are not available for use. So we decided to use extended contact times. Uh, High-level disinfectants should be sterilants. Other, uh, meaning killing everything at extended contact times under regulatory requirements. 
So using our GTA, we used contact times of 24 and 48 hours. And for the OPA, we used a contact time of 24 hours. And even at these extended contact times, neither OPA or GTA were able to kill or deactivate HPV at any, any measurable amount. So this left us with uh, nothing to use, basically. So we had a question, is there a solution for this HPV disinfection of ultrasound probes? That's when we started to study this uh, automated uh, high-level disinfection system that uses nebulized hydrogen peroxide. So there's sonicated hydrogen peroxide, which means there's no toxic byproducts. There's a short cycle of seven minutes. The actual contact time is more like two minutes, but the full cycle for the machine is seven minutes. It includes a probe and the handle. They both fit inside the machine. It provides a computerized record. It has an internal indicator, and we have shown now that it's HPV effective. So in the first test, we, we, we did suspension tests. But actually, the carrier, or the solid uh, material test, represents more real-life circumstances. So we use these carrier discs, which are made from the same plastic used in ultrasound transducers. And this is a more relevant test and required by the TGA and the FDA, as opposed to our previous suspension test. So in this, the carrier test, we used both HPV-16 and HPV-18. We would spread the virus on the carriers and let it dry out, and we were able, we know that we can recover over 90% of the HPV and of the infectious HPV once we dried it on these carriers. So we took these carriers with the dried HPV and we put them in the automated, automated high-level disinfection system and ran it. We also tested against uh, OPA for 12 minutes according to the manufacturer recommendations and hyperchloride according to the manufacturer recommendation for five minutes. And here are the results from our HPV carrier test. On the left, you can see the, uh, the graph for HPV-16, and on the right, the graph for HPV-18. This is our same log 10 reduction, so everything uh, is a log 10 reduction. It, you can see our dotted red line, which represents the FDA for log reduction requirement. And if you see an asterisk, that means there's complete inactivation of the virus, that even in our, uh, our most sensitive uh, measurement, we could not see any replication upon infection of the HPV genome. So with HPV-16, you can see right off that using 35% hydrogen peroxide had a much greater than a four-log reduction in, in, in infectious virus, and that it had complete inactivation of the virus. We also tested 31.5% hydrogen peroxide. We still see our four-log reduction, and we still cannot uh, see measure any inactivation of the virus where OPA, again, was inadequate or ineffective at reducing virus infectivity at any uh, measurable amount, and hyperchlorite, again, was giving us a greater than four log reduction. HPV-18, again, uh, similar to 16, could give greater than a four log reduction, whether we use 35% or 31.5%, and, and o OPA uh, was unable to deactivate HPV or hyper hypochlorite, again, uh, was able to deactivate or kill HPV at greater than a four log reduction. So according to this data, that uh, this um, automated high-level disinfection system was, was effective at deactivating or killing both HPV-16 and HPV-18. So the escalating risk of ultrasound probe reprocessing. You can look at this chart we've put together. This is how we see the escalating risk. HPV DNA was found on, is found on probes and probe sheets after use. HPV DNA remains on probes even after cleaning procedures are done. High-level disinfectants, GTA and OPA, are, are ineffective at deactivating or killing HPV. HPV can remain infectious for several days on an inanimate surface. And 
the probe is reused, HPV transmission can occur with skin and mucous membrane contact. So what is the global responses to these HPV results? Well, I can give you some information about the USA and France. We do know that the regulatory authorities in these two countries are taking notice of this data. In the United States, GTA and OPA are accepted as high-level disinfectants for ultrasound probes. However, OPA and GTA are ineffective at killing HPV. And remember, our definition, if it's high-level disinfection according to the FDA, that means it should be able to kill HPV, and our data shows that OPA and GTA do not uh, uh, indeed kill HPV. The FDA and the CDC are aware of this situation. They have not yet made any recommendations. We know that the CDC is seeking funding to do further research to uh, corroborate our results with uh, their colleagues at the University of North Carolina. In France, I recently uh, attended a meeting in Nantes, France. Uh, it was their SF2H meeting, their, their infectious control meeting for the country. Um, I presented this work there. It was uh, well received. Uh, currently, French guidelines advise that upon inspection of the sheath and probe, if there are no tears nor, and no soiling, that low-level disinfection is acceptable for reprocessing intercavity ultrasound probes. The, although while I was there, I did talk to members of their Ministry of Health, and the Ministry of Health is modern, monitoring their guidelines, and HPV is an issue that they are discussing and considering now. Here's a statement over here on the right that was given before this meeting on May 10th in 2016, where they stated in France, with regards to HPV, this analysis shows heterogeneity in the efficacy of physical and chemical intermediary uh, level disinfection techniques. Systematic performance of an intermediary uh, level disinfection equivalent to the USA high level disinfection between each patient is likely to prevent the spread of contaminants associated with biological fluid during intercavity ultrasound examination. What can sonography professionals do to protect, their, uh, to protect their patients? So what are the practical HPV risk mitigation? Well, one is reducing transmission of HPV via hands. We know that alcohols do not kill HPV. Alcohols are in hand rubs and environmental disinfectants. They kill bacteria and some viruses. They do not kill non-envelope viruses such as HPV. So what are the recommendations we can give you today? Well, gloves, of course, are the best for all pathogens as long as they are changed frequently. That means be between patient examinations and before handling of reprocessed probes. We also recommend take care not to contaminate your hands when removing gloves. Hand washing may be better than hand gels because there's a physical removal or washing away that could take place of these virus particles. So how to reduce transmission risk from the surfaces and uh, probes. We know that hyperchlorite kills HPV, and it can be used on environmental surfaces. So recommendations are to consider intermittent uh, surface cleaning with hyperchlorite once a week. Uh, physical cleaning can help remove the microorganisms. Automated hydrogen peroxide, we know, can kill HPV. And it's designed for these ultrasound probes. So the recommendation is to consider using an HPV effective ultrasound probe disinfection product. This is very important for intercavity probes. Also, uh, you need to consider reducing transmission risk via probe storage. Our recommendations today would be that to store the reprocessed probes in such a way to prevent recontamination from the environment. Handle reprocessed probes carefully to avoid cross-contamination and handle with fresh, clean gloves only. Make sure probe is thoroughly dry after reprocessing. Store the probe away from airflow, heat, humidity, and moisture. 
Consider using storage covers, but make sure the probe is dry first before you use the cover. Selecting a disinfectant probe, uh, our recommendations there would be to carefully review the justification for efficacy, efficacy claims. The only test acceptable to establish efficacy against HPV in Australia or the USA is a test on native infectious HPV virus. High level disinfectants by definition should be effective against HPV. We have found some high level disinfectants to be effective against HPV, raising questions as to whether they should remain in this category. At present, we are the only lab in the world that can test efficacy against native HPV. There are no recognized surrogate viruses for HPV in Australia or the USA. In Germany, SV40 virus has previously been used. However, there is no data to link HPV and SV40 sensitivity to disinfectants. HPV and SV40s are not even the same virus family. In order to establish efficacy, regulators such as the TGA and FDA require the use of large amounts of virus in standardized tests to represent the worst case scenarios. Clinical tests showing an absence of HPV on probes are interesting, but are not reliable indicators of HPV efficacy under worst case conditions. I need to recognize at this time that people who have worked in my lab, those in red are the ones that have done most of the hands-on work in our studies for disinfectants. Um, right now, I will stop my talking and turn the time over to the moderator, and if you have any questions, I'll be try my best to answer them. Okay, thank you very much, Craig. Uh, very interesting presentation. Um, as you've been speaking, you know, some questions are starting to come in, but uh, just to give people a little bit more time to, to put those in, I might start off with a, with a question. Um, you know, something we hear a lot about at the moment is the vaccination that's available for HPV. How do you think that factors into uh, the need for proper disinfection? Well, some would say since we have a vaccination um, and the vaccine is, is a very good vaccine, that we don't need to take all these precautions. But the, the reality is, first, there's a lot of people who are already infected with the virus before they get the vaccine. And the vaccine is not therapeutic. It's only prophylactic. So once you are infected with the virus, the vaccine will not remove that virus from you. The other big issue is the number of people that are actually being vaccinated. In the United States, it's, it's about one-third of the uh, population that, is, um, that can be vaccinated is actually vaccinated. So there's a large portion of the population that goes unvaccinated. In places like France and Germany, I, I understand that their uh, percentage of people being vaccinated is even less than what it is in the USA. I was recently told in France that about 18% of the population is being vaccinated. So even though we have a very good vaccine that's available, you can see in many countries and in many areas of the world that the vaccine is just not being used. And so our risk of transmission for HPV um, is not going down in any significant way right now. Okay, you, any more questions? Uh, yeah, no, that's, that's very enlightening. There are quite a few questions coming in now, so <clears throat> let me just read, read this question out to you. Um, so in the automated device testing, Dr. Myers used hard plastic rather than a suspension solution to assess HPV de deactivation. The question is, did he do a similar real-world surface test in his initial testing? I see that OPA didn't deactivate HPV in the hard plastic testing, but why not such surfaces in the initial test? Maybe I can paraphrase that, uh, Craig, a little bit. Um, are you able to, uh, well, first tell us, did you do any carrier tests in the first batch of testing? And then I guess contrast the difference between a suspension test and a carrier test and how that relates to, uh, to disinfection. No, I, I, yeah, in the first study, we did all suspension tests. You know, at that point, 
we were actually expecting many of these things to deactivate HPV. So we did, we did a simple suspension test, um, which we were set up at that time to be able to do. So we did not do any, uh, any um, surface testing, uh, hard plastic surface testing. In the second uh, manuscript, we did do uh, surface testing. Um, the big difference, of course, there is, is the surface testing is more like the real-life situation. The plastic we use for these discs is the same material that you find on these probes. So it represents virus on the same material uh, requiring deactivation in a similar way. We also, on the uh, uh, surface test, we included soil which uh, by definition is something, you know, you can use something like uh, sura, bovine serum albumin or something like that. And so we had 5% soil mixed in with the, the virus solution when we dried it on the carrier test. Again, to represent a more uh, real-life, real-world situation. So in our hands, whether we use the suspension test or whether we use the hard surface carrier test, uh, these common hospital sterilants of GTA and OPA were ineffective, so it didn't matter which type of system we used. They were they were disinfect. They were uh, ineffective in both situations. Uh, I hope that answers your question. I, I think that was great. Thanks, Craig. So the next question here: Should we worry about the cleaning efficacy of HLDs on bronchoscopes and laryngoscopes? And I guess. We could extend this to uh, many other medical devices which are used in uh, intracavity procedures as well. Yeah, um, I haven't thought much about bronchioscopes. I have uh, thought about the laryngoscopes. I have some colleagues in our head and neck department. I mean, theoretically, if a laryngoscope is used properly, it should not come in contact with the area where the infection occurs. Now, that's, of course, if everything's done properly, and, and I know that doesn't always work that way. So our, my recommendation would be to make sure that whatever system you're using to uh, process your laryngoscopes or your brachioscopes, that you use a system that has been shown to have efficacy against deactivating HPV. Uh, and so I, I, would, I would recommend similar um, processing as you would with the, the ultrasound probes. Sure. Um, we've got another question here. Have other high-level disinfectors, i.e. UV disinfectors, tested against H been tested against HPV 16 and, and 18 and their efficacy? And I guess, Craig, you could probably talk about um, all high-level disinfectants, you know, as part of your answer with UV being an example. No, uh, you know, only those that we listed and that you saw today in the presentation are the disinfectants that we, we covered. You know, we, in the initial part, I had uh, my colleague who is very active in studying disinfectants um, efficacy in select agents, uh, just suggested that group to start with, and then we worked with this, we were trying to find a way to find something that was effective, and the, the, this automated system came on our radar screen, and so we decided to test it. Um, there's still several things we, we should and uh, need to test, like quats, and uh, I always get asked, you know, what about hand soap? It's something I, I need to do and I'm planning to, to do soon. And the UV, uh, using UV light as a disinfection, that, that is something we uh, have the plans and the protocol in place, and so in the next couple months we should be able to test UV light as a, a potential disinfectant. So what we're saying right now is the only thing we know at this moment that works is this um, high-level disinfection automated system using per hydrogen peroxide. We know that those other things that I showed you today do not work, but anything that's not in any of those lists, I cannot tell you right now whether they work or not. We're hoping to test those in the near future. Thank you for that question. Great. Um, another one here. Thank you, Craig. Can you give me your best scenario of how you would wish us to store our probes? Well, I think if you just go back and look at that slide, you know, that you store it in an area where it's not going to have a chance of environmental contamination. And I, I understand, I, I, you know, these probes are used in emergency departments where things can get quite, uh, from, uh, you know, 
exciting at, at times, let's say, and, and it just takes uh, time to properly process the probe and then store it, that you store it away from, you know, airflow and humidity. Uh, I mean, it would be really uh, good if you could if it, uh, store it in a cover. You know, once the probe is dried, that you put it in a cover to protect it against possible recontamination from the environment. So just those basic, uh, you know, kind of common sense things to put your probes in a place once they're processed so that the environment cannot recontaminate them. I hope that answers your question. Perfect. We've got plenty of questions coming in uh, now. So uh, another one here. Have you had any proven HPV infections caused by ultrasound probes? Yes, I've been asked that question. Now, this is a very difficult thing to prove. All we can prove right now, I'll say right at the beginning, is that there is a risk of transmission. There is a potential risk of transmission. Okay, so in cases of, like, let's say some bacteria, you know, where you're going to get sick within 24 or 48 hours after uh, being infected by that bacteria, it's very easy for somebody to follow that back to the point of infection, that somebody could take the patients and find out that it was the infection occurred in that hospital setting. Now, HPV infects people, but there is no symptoms usually for uh, months, even years, even decades. You can be infected with HPV. It could be re replicating. You could be contaminating other people without ever knowing it for years and years and years and even decades. You know, before symptoms occur, it could be a long time. So to be able to go back and pinpoint where that infection came from would be a very difficult thing. So if somebody was to try to do this, I think there's a possibility you could design a study to do this, but it would take a lot of time and a lot of resources to do. So right now, all that I can say is that there is a potential risk of transmission of HPV. And because there is a potential risk, I think uh, patients have the right to know of that potential risk. So that's the best answer I can give you at this time. Sure. Craig, we've got a few questions coming in here from people about a particular product. And of course, uh, we won't mention specific names of products, but because there are a few, I think it's important to talk about. So um, what, I what are your views on uh, a three-wipe system for disinfecting HPV? So that would be a a cleaning wipe, a disinfecting wipe with chlorine dioxide, and then a rinse wipe? I mean, it's better than a single wipe, but again, um, you know, this is a very tenacious virus. It, 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 it survives through a lot. And so if there is no evidence that what is used can actually deactivate HPV, um, then I would question it as a as a true high level disinfection. Um, if these uh, the materials in the wipes do not actually kill the virus, then you could be just cleaning some of the crud off without really killing any virus that's stuck on there. And remember, these devices aren't a perfectly smooth system that there is areas where the virus can actually get in and, and hide. And so um, it, it's better than one wipe because you're, you're creating more physical agitation on the surface. But um, again, we cannot say that those uh, substances that are in the wipes will actually kill the virus. I think that's the best answer I can give you at this time. Great. Um, we, we have another question here. I might actually try to take this one. So it says, what category does translabial or transperineal ultrasound fall into, HLD or LLD? So it, it has to do really with the intended use of the medical device and conceivably what that probe could come into contact with during the procedure. And if there is a chance that a probe will come into contact with a mucous membrane, and I think for both of those procedures it's highly likely, uh, that, that probe should be high-level disinfected. Uh, and actually, this is an important thing. We, we, there was a slide in the presentation, I think, uh, you know, when we send this around to everyone, it's quite a useful tool, kind of a decision tree about how you figure out 
for each procedure whether something is a you know semi-critical, critical or non-critical device. But it's to do with the intended use and the expectation that it may come into contact with either intact skin, mucous membranes or, or sterile tissue. I, I just wanted to bring that one up because I think it's quite important. Um, Craig, are you able to um, contrast um, PCR-based tests uh, and compare those to, I guess, the native virus test that, testing that you've done? Oh, okay, I understand the question. So in, those pa in some papers that have come out recently showing that these probes are still contaminated with HPV DNA, um, all three of the papers that I'm familiar with went in and just looked by PCR for the presence of HPV DNA. So the question can come up is, well, you found DNA, but is there really a virus particle there? Well, one of the papers did a little clever uh, experiment in their studies where they actually treated the samples with a nuclease. So if there was just uh, naked DNA there, the nuclease would chew it all up and it, and it wouldn't show a result in the PCR test. So and this is something we often do in our lab. You know, we want to show that we're actually measuring virus particles and not measuring naked DNA. Um, and so we will treat our samples with a nuclease, so all the naked DNA gets chewed up. Then in this paper that I'm talking about, they went on after treating with a nuclease and acted like they had virus particles. So they used the technique to crack open the capsids, and then they used their PCR to measure virus uh, DNA. And they were able to detect it again after using the nuclease on their initial sample. So I think they did the best uh, possible mechanism. Again, it's something we use in our own lab that, you know, if it was just naked DNA, that the nuclease would get rid of it. So there was probably the actual presence of virus particles on these probes when they tested them. Sure. So that's, that's, a, that's a quite a complex issue. I guess, you know, the upshot, if I can try to summarize and please correct me uh, on anything. Um, basically, if you have DNA from the virus, you detect that with PCR, you can get rid of free DNA that's not part of functional virus, and that's what these, uh, these folks did. And so what we're really measuring is functional virus there. And of course, in your assays, you're dealing with the real virus in very high, high quantities. That a, is that a fair summary, Craig? Yes, I think it is. Great. Uh, we just have, uh, we're kind of slowing down on the questions now, but we have another one uh, that has come in. Why do you think that some disinfectants worked against HPV and others did not? Um, you have to look at what the chemistry is of these disinfectants, like specifically the GTA and OPA. They're... Um, they like to cross-link lysine residues on the surface of the protein. And so this would suggest that um, there is either the lysine residues are not um, available on the surface of HPV, or they're not close enough or in a configuration where they can be cross-linked. And so if you look at the things that we've now shown to deactivate HPV, these are oxidizing agents. So it seems that it's susceptible to an oxidizing uh, reagent, but not uh, sensitive to uh, something that will cross-link lysines like GTA and OPA will. Um, we are in the midst with my collaborator uh, to try to understand and, and come up with more of a mechanism for this. And we have uh, some preliminary data that's very exciting, which suggests that the lysines just aren't present on the surface. So uh, maybe in the near future we'll have be able to repeat that enough and, and be presenting that, that information. Right. We okay. Just, we've just got a couple more questions coming in here, Craig. All right. Uh, there's, there's one here. Would you recommend single-use gel uh, is used with semi-critical semi devices? And I guess that's, you know, contrasting the, the reusable uh, bottle of gel with multiple doses versus a single, single sachet. Well, the one thing that that would do, if you remember from the one slide where I showed pictures of uh, different, ob different things in the gynecological office, 
that the gel tube actually was contaminated. I believe it was a little over 6% of the time. And so, you know, because these uh, things can be contaminated through common use, maybe a single package of gel would remove that one potential of having something touched that's contaminated with HPV. So instead of using a, a gel tube over and over again, um, you would have that one package and therefore there would be no risk of it being contaminated because after that patient it would be thrown away in a new one. Now that, of course, requires that you change, you know, the gloves are changed uh, often so that you're not taking a glove from one time with a patient to another time with a patient. Even, you know, even if you, the patient leaves the room and you're moving things around and then you take off your gloves and clean your hands for the next patient, you still touch things in the room with those gloves. So you, you need to be um, conscious of what you're touching every time you have your gloves on. Sure, and I think, you know, um, there have been a, a number of studies over the years that have uh, linked outbreaks uh, to contaminated gel. Uh, you know, the, the chance that you touch that onto someone's skin uh, and then there are organisms that then later grow in that or, or contaminate. Um, certainly for uh, critical procedures, you must use sterile gel, single use. Uh, for semi-critical, you know, we do know that the, the probe covers leak. So, uh, you know, I, I think it's pertinent to, to use uh, single use. Uh, package for that application. We, we've ha we have a couple more questions coming in. Um, so there's one here. Would you suggest that an automated process is more effective than a manual process? Well, right now, the, the we don't know of any manual process uh, that is effective at killing HPV. Only this automotive uh, machine that uses hydrogen peroxide uh, is effective. In, um, if you're going, you might want to suggest that you're going to use hydrogen peroxide then in the uh, type of liquid suspension test, but this has not been um, tested, and you have to make sure before you do this that you go through the proper uh, protocols to do all the testing to make sure that it is, what you're going to do is actually effective. Um, and so there's a possibility that it could work, but it, it needs to be tested first. Uh, you, you, you can't just trans, um, translate what you do in one type of assay to another type of assay because there's a lot of uh, per parts of the process that are different. And so they both need to be tested before you can declare one as efficacious and one uh, or not. So I think that's all I know to say on that. That's, that's great. I think we'll probably make this the last question, uh, Craig. Uh, you know, we've had a great response from everybody, so thank you everyone for sending your questions in. So this last one reads, thank you, Craig. I'm a sonographer who works in cardiology environment, so just wanted to ask you what is the recommended time you would prescribe for disinfecting the transesophageal probe in Cytex or OPA solution? In Cytex or OPA solution, there is no uh, recommended time that I could give you. Uh, if you remember, I actually tested the OPA for up to 24 hours, and this would be probably impractical for probe use in a hospital setting. And it 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 didn't even show a one log drop in deactivation. You know, it was it was ineffective at, at killing. Um, I can tell you from my own lab, we used to use Cytokon to clean everything. After we got these results, we, we now use, because, you know, we use bleach on all our surfaces to clean things now. And so uh, I would not, there, I do not believe there is any contact time for OPA or Cytokon that would be effective at killing HPV. Great, thanks, Craig. Well, I think we'll wrap things up there. Uh, thanks again to all the attendees uh, for the for the great questions. Uh, just for your information, we had around 250 people attend uh, this evening. Uh, so we will uh, send the the slides and the webinar links out to you over the next few days. If you wish to view the the webinar again or share with co colleagues, please feel free to do so. And CBD will, will still be available if you want to pass that on to, to friends and colleagues. So. 
Thanks very much, everybody. I hope, uh, hope you've enjoyed the, the presentation this evening, uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you again at a future event. Yes, thank you. Thanks very much. And thank you, Craig, for, uh, for, for the presentation. Really great. All right, thanks, My pleasure. Everyone. Thank you.